And chapter 21, Captain Nemo's Thunderbolt. We looked at the edge of the forest without rising, my hands stopping in the action of putting it to my mouth and Ned Land's completing its office. Stones do not fall from the sky, remarked Council, or they merit the name of aerolites. A second stone, carefully aimed, that made a savory pigeon's leg fall from Council's hand gave still more weight to his observation. We all three arose, shouldered our guns, and were ready to reply to an attack. Are they apes? cried Ned Land. Very nearly they are savages. To the boat, I said, hurrying to the sea. It was indeed necessary to beat a retreat, for about twenty natives armed with bows and slings appeared on the skirts of a copse that masked the horizon to the right, hardly a hundred steps from us. Our boat was moored about sixty feet from us, and the savages approached us, not running, but making hostile demonstrations. Stones and arrows fell thickly. Ned Land had not wished to leave his provisions, and in spite of his eminent danger, his pig on one side and kangaroos on the other, he went tolerably fast. In two minutes we were on the shore. To load the boat with provisions and arms, to push it out to sea, and ship the oars was the work of an instant. We had not gone two cable lengths when a hundred savages, howling and gesticulating, entered the water up to their waists. I watched to see if their apparition would attract some men from the Nautilus on the platform, but no. The enormous machine lying off was absolutely deserted. Twenty minutes later we were on board and the panels were open. After making the boat fast, we entered into the interior of the Nautilus. I descended to the drawing room. From hence I heard some chords. Captain Nemo was there bending over his organ and plunged in a musical ecstasy. Captain! He did not hear me. Captain! I said again, touching his hand. He shuddered and turned around and said, Aye, it is you, Professor. Well, have you had a good hunt? Have you botanized successfully? Yes, Captain, but we have unfortunately brought a troop of bipeds whose vicinity troubles me. What bipeds? Savages. Savages? He echoed ironically. So you are astonished, Professor, at having set foot on a strange land and finding savages? Savages? Where are there not any? Besides, are they any worse than others? These whom you call savages? The captain. How many have you counted? A hundred at least. Mr. Arona replied, Captain Nemo, placing his fingers on the organ stops. When all the natives of Pampo are assembled on this shores, the Nautilus will have nothing to fear from their attacks. The captain's fingers were then running over the keys of the instrument. I remarked that he touched only the black keys, which gave to his melodies an essentially Scotch character. Soon he had forgotten my presence and had plunged into a reverie that I did not disturb. I went up again to the platform. Night had already fallen, for in this low altitude the sun sets rapidly and without twilight. I could only see the island indistinctively, but the numerous fires lighted on the beach showed that the natives did not think of leaving it. I was alone for several hours, sometimes sinking in the natives, but without any dread of them, for the imperpetuable confidence of the captain was catching sometimes forgetting them to admire the splendors of the night in the tropics. My remembrances went to France, in the train of those zodiacal stars that would shine in some hour's time. The moon shined in the midst of the constellations of the zenith. The night spilled away without any mischance, and the islanders frightened, no doubt, at the sight of a monster aground on the bay. The panels were open and would have offered an easy access to the interior of the Nautilus. At six o'clock in the morning on the 8th of January, I went up to the platform and the dawn was breaking. The island soon showed itself through the dissipating fogs, first the shore, then the summits. The natives were there, more numerous than on the day before. Five hundred or six hundred, perhaps some of them, profiting from the low water, had come onto the coral, at less than two cable lengths from the Nautilus. I distinguished them easily. They were true. Papoans, with athletic figures, men of good race, large high foreheads, but not broad and flat and white teeth. Their woolly hair with a reddish tinge showed off their black shining bodies like those of the Nubians. From the lobes of their ears cut and distended hung chaplets of bones. 
Most of these savages were naked. Amongst them I reckoned some women dressed from the hips to the knees in quite a crinoline of herbs that sustained a vegetable waistband. Some chiefs had ornated their necks with a crescent and collars of glass beads, red and white. Nearly all were armed with bows, arrows, shields, and carried on their shoulders a sort of net containing these round stones which they cast from their slings with great skill. One of these chiefs, rather near to the Nautilus, examined it attentively. He was perhaps a Mado of high rank, for he was draped in a mat of banana leaves, notched around the edges, and set off with brilliant colors. I could easily have knocked down this native, who was within a short length, but I thought that it was better to wait for real hostile demonstrations. Between Europeans and savages, it is proper for the Europeans to parry sharply, not to attack. During low water, the natives roamed around in the Nautilus, near the Nautilus, but were not troublesome. I heard them frequently repeat the words assay, and by their gestures I understood that they invited me to go on land, an invitation that I declined, so that on that day the boat did not push off, to the great displeasure of Master Land, who could not complete his provisions. The adroit Canadian employed his time in preparing the vivins and meats that he had brought off the island. As for the savages, they returned to the shore about eleven o'clock in the morning as soon as the coral tops began to disappear under the rising tide. But I saw their numbers had increased considerably on the shore. Probably they came from the neighboring islands or very likely from Pompeii. However, I had not seen a single native canoe. Having nothing better to do, I thought of dragging these beautiful, lipid waters under which I saw a profusion of shells, zoophytes, and marine plants. Moreover, it was the last day that the Nautilus would pass in these parts, if it float in open sea the next day, according to Captain Nemo's promise. I therefore called Council, who brought me a little light drag, very little from those of the oyster fishery, now to work. For two hours we fished unceasingly, but without bringing up any rarities. The drag was filled with Midas ears, harps, malames, and particularly the most beautiful hammers I'd ever seen. We also brought up some holluras, pearl oysters, and a dozen little turtles that were reserved for the pantry on board. But just when I expected at least, I put my hand on a wonder. I might say a natural deformity, very rarely met with. Council was just dragging, and his net came up filled with diver's ordinary shells, when all at once he saw me plunge my arm quickly into the net to draw out a shell, and heard me utter a, conclo a conchological cry, that is to say the most piercing cry that human throat can utter. What's the matter, sir? he asked in surprise. Has master been bitten? No, my boy. But I would willingly have given a finger for my discovery. What discovery? This shell. I was holding up the object of my triumph. It is simply an olive prophyry, genus olive order of the Pectimbracidae, class of gastropods, subclass of mollusca. Yes, counsel. But instead of being rolled from right to left, this olive turns from left to right. Is it possible? Yes, my boy, it is a left shell. Shells are all right-handed, with rare exceptions. And when by chance their spiral is left, amateurs are ready to pay their weight in gold. Council and I were absorbed in the contemplation of our treasure, and I was promising myself to enrich the museum with it when a stone, unfortunately thrown by a native, struck against and broke the precious object in Council's hand. I uttered a cry of despair. Council took up his gun and aimed at the savage who was posing his sling at ten yards from him. I would have stopped him, but his blow took effect and broke the bracelets of amulets which encircled the arm of the savage. Council, I cried I, Council! Well, sir, do you not see the cannibal has commenced the attack? A shell is not worth the life of a man, said I. Ah, the scoundrel, tried Council. I would rather he had broken my shoulder. Council was in earnest, but I was not of his opinion. However, the situation had cha changed some minutes before, and we had not perceived. A score of canoes surrounded the Nautilus. These canoes, scooped out of the trunk of a tree, long, narrow, well adapted for speed, were balanced by means of a long bamboo pole, 
which floated on the water. They were managed by skillful, half-naked paddlers, and I watched their advance with some uneasiness. It was evident that the Papuans had already had dealings with the Europeans and knew their ships. But this long iron cylinder anchored in the bay, without masts or chimneys, what could they think of it? Nothing good, for at first they kept at a respectable distance. However, seeing it motionless, by degree, they took courage and sought to familiarize themselves with it. Now this familiarity was precisely what it was necessarily to avoid. Our arms, which were noiseless, could only produce a moderate effect on the savages, who had little respect for aught but blustering things. The thunderbolt without the reverberations of thunder would frighten man but little, though the danger lies in the lightning, not in the noise. At this moment the canoes approached the Nautilus, and a shower of arrows alighted on her. I went down to the saloon, found no one there. I ventured to knock at the door that opened in the captain's room. Come in, was the answer. I entered and found Captain Nemo deep in algebraical calculations of X and other quantities. I am disturbing you, said I, for curtsy's sake. And that is true, Mr. Aronoff, replied the captain, but I think you have seri serious reasons for wishing to see me. Very grave ones. The natives are surrounding us in their canoes, and in a couple of minutes we shall certainly be attacked by many hundreds of savages. Ah, said Captain Nemo quietly. They are come with their canoes? Yes, sir. All right. Well, sir, we must close the hatches. Exactly. And I came to say, nothing can be more simple, said Captain Nemo. And pressing an electric button, he transmitted an order to the ship's crew. It's all done, said he, after some moments. The pinnac is ready and the hatches are closed. You do not fear. I imagine that these gentlemen could stave in walls of which the balls of your frigate have no effect. No, Captain, but a danger still exists. What is that, sir? It is that tomorrow, at about this hour, we must open the hatches to renew the air of the Nautilus. Now, if this moment the Papuans should occupy the platform, I do not see how you could prevent them from entering. Then, sir, you suppose that they will board us? I'm certain of it. Well, sir, let them come. I have no reason for hindering them. After all, the Papuans are poor creatures, and I'm unwilling that my visit to the island of Grubowen would cost the life of a single one of those wretcheds. Upon that, I was going away, but Captain Nemo detained me and asked me to sit down by him. He questioned me with earnest about our excursions on shore and our hunting, and seemed not to understand the craving for meat that possessed the Canadian. Then the conversation turned on various subjects, and without being more communicative, Captain Nemo showed himself more amiable. Among other things, we happen to speak of the situation of the Nautilus, run aground in exactly the same spot of this strait where Dumont de Rovelle was nearly lost. Apropos of this, this Derville was one of your great sailors, said the captain to me, one of the most intelligent navigators. He is the Captain Cook of the Frenchman. Unfortunately, man, unfortunately, man of science, after having braved the icebergs of the South Pole, the coral reefs of Oceania, the cannibals of the Pacific to perish miserably in a railway train. If this energetic man could have reflected during the last moments of, a lo of his life, what must have been uppermost in his last thoughts, do you suppose? So speaking, Captain Nemo seemed moved, and his emotion gave me a better opinion of him. Then, chart in hand, he reviewed the travels of the French navigator, his voyage of circumnavigation, his double detention at the South Pole, which led to the discovery of Adelaide and Louis-Philippe, and fixing the hydrographical bearings of the principal islands of Oceania. That which your de Urvol has gone on the surface of the sea, said Captain Nemo, that I have done under them, and more easily and more completely than him. The astrolabe and the zelia, incessantly tossed about by the hurricanes, could not be worth the Nautilus, quiet repository of labor that she is, truly motionless in the midst of the waters. Tomorrow, added the captain, rising, tomorrow, at 20 minutes to 3 p.m., the Nautilus shall float and leave the Strait of Tories uninjured. Having curtly pronounced these words, Captain Nemo bowed slightly. This was to dismiss me, and I went back to my room. 
There I found counsel who wished to know the result of my interview with the captain. My boy, said I, when I feigned to believe that his Nautilus was threatened by the natives of Papu, the captain answered me very sarcastically. I have but one thing to say to you. Have confidence in him and go to sleep in peace. Have you no need of my services, sir? No, my friend. What is Ned Land doing? Well, if you'll excuse me, sir, answered counsel. Friend, Ned is busy making a kangaroo pie, which will be a marvel. I remained alone and went to bed, but slept indifferently. I heard the noise of the savages who stamped on the platform uttering deafening cries. The night passed thus without disturbing the ordinary repose of, of the crew. The presence of these cannibals affected them no more than the soldiers of a masked battery care for the ants that crawl over its front. At six in the morning, the hatches had not been opened, the inner air was not renewed, but the reservoirs, filled ready for any emergency, were now resorted to, and discharged several cubic feet of oxygen into the exhausted atmosphere of the Nautilus. I worked in my room till noon without having seen Captain Nemo even for an instant. On board, no preparations for departure were visible. I waited still some time, then went into the large saloon and the clock marked half past two. In ten minutes it would be high tide, and if Captain Nemo had not made a rash promise, the Nautilus would be immediately detached. If not, many mouths would pass ere she could have leave, left her bed of coral. However, some warning vibrations began to be felt in the vessel. I heard the keel grating against the rough, curacious bottom of the coral reef. At five and twenty minutes to three, Captain Nemo appeared in the saloon. We're going to start, said he. Aye, replied I. I've given the order to open the hatches. And the Papuans? The Papuans, answered Captain Nemo, slightly shrugging his shoulders. Will they not come inside the Nautilus? How? Only by leaping over the hatches you've opened. Mr. Arona quietly answered Captain Nemo. They will not enter the hatches of the Nautilus in that way, even if they were open. I looked at the captain. You don't understand, said he. Hardly. Well, come, and you'll see. I directed my steps toward the central staircase. There, Ned Land and Council were slyly watching some of the ship's crews who were opening the hatches, while cries of rage and fearful vociferations resounded outside. The port lids were pulled down outside. Twenty horrible faces appeared, but the first native, who placed his hand on the star rail, struck from behind by some invisible force. I do not what, know what, fled uttering the most fearful cries and making the wildest contortions. Ten of his companions followed him, and they met with the same fate. Council was in ecstasy. Ned Land, carried away, away by his violent instincts, rushed onto the staircase. That the moment he seized the rail with both hands, he in his turn was overthrown. I'm struck by a thunderbolt, cried he with an oath. This explained all. It was no rail, but a metallic cable, charged with electricity from the deck, communicating with the platform. Whoever touched it felt a powerful shock. And this shock would have been mortal if Captain Nemo had discharged in the conductor the whole force of the current. It might truly be said that between his assailants and himself, he had stretched a network of electricity which none could pass with impunity. Meanwhile, the exasperated Papuans had beaten a retreat, paralyzed with terror. As for us, half laughing, we consoled and rubbed the unfortunate Ned Land, who swore like no one possessed. But at this moment, the Nautilus raised by the last waves of the tide, quitted her coral bread bed exactly at the 14th minute fixed by the captain. Her screw swept the water slowly and majestically. Her speed increased gradually, and sailing on the surface of the ocean, she quitted safe and sound the dangerous passes of the Straits of Tories. <laughs>